May the blessings of God be upon you all. From the outset, I would like to welcome Dr. Khaled Al Jaber, Dr. Imad Khadura, Dr. Mehran Kamrava, and Dr. Nikolai Kozanov. The session today will be on GCC Iranian relations and specifically in the post Trump era. And we welcome all our followers and viewers, and we thank the Arab Center for hosting this event in very difficult circumstances. We were hoping to meet you in person, but you know the pandemic and the circumstances surrounding that have um, denied us the opportunity. We start with Dr. Khaled Al Jaber. He'll speak on the future of U.S. Gulf relations in the post-Trump era. Thank you, Dr. Khaled. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sahim, uh, for this uh, introduction and uh, our thanks and appreciations to the Arab Center who have made us now become accustomed to this uh, event which takes place annually. And uh, it's obvious that year after year, the window of freedom narrows and with it, uh, the freedom of uh, or the ability to maybe think and express uh, this is not just in the arab world maybe elsewhere i'm in washington and we all think that this is a very important uh, period this year was really fraught with difficulties and challenges not at the level of the gcc the gulf countries or Europe or the United States, but the entire world has been suffering from this pandemic, which has not only impacted the health and medical uh, part, and but the, we all suffered, but it also had political, economic, and social uh, repercussions, probably the most important among which, in my opinion, is the fact that the current president, Donald Trump, uh, losing the elections. And I am convinced that uh, through dealing with the pandemic by Trump and his team was the cause to a large extent uh, the reason for losing the election. And uh, if, it, if it wasn't for the pandemic and its aftermath and what has followed uh, from the economic uh, uh, crisis, we wouldn't have seen the same result probably in the elections. And of course, even the president-elect is still suffering from the challenges created by President Trump by not conceding defeat and leveling all these accusations. If we start with the title of this session, The Future of U.S.-Gulf Relations in the Post-Trump Era, maybe we must pause for a few seconds and take a look. It's obvious that the Trump era is not over yet. The, the prob uh, 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 it is probable also that not only the Trump era is uh, not over yet, but it's likely to return to because of the the difference in the margin in in the votes gained by him and by Biden was very narrow indeed. And this is as is described in foreign policy, the United States has become like two countries, one country voting for Trump and uh, uh, his uh, idea since 2016 at the political, economic levels, at the level of healthcare, and also dealing with internal issues and external issues, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, another vision presented by Biden, supported by the left and the liberals. The first time we see this 
deep divide in the United States. This is not new, but uh, it's becoming like uh, a snowball gaining more in size and momentum day after day. It seems that Trump, uh, the Trump uh, phenomena has turned into a Trump uh, condition or situation and maybe this version of it can return in a more uh, abhorrent way, unfortunately, in view of the continued failure in dealing with different issues and the, in, con with the continuation of the economic uh, crisis. This can impact large sections of American society. It's obvious that the ones who benefit from this are the majority in the United States who are present in the United States who feel they'll become a minority. So the, the Anglo-Saxon Protestants, the, uh, I mean by them, the, uh, the, the section is the uh, Anglo-Saxon white Protestants who fear this wave of colored people who have helped Biden reach uh, the White House. So this populist uh, uh, way, we do not see it in the United States, unfortunately, but we see it in the West in general. Even the rhetoric by the French president about Islam and other issues uh, indicates that there is a discourse which is uh, being crystallized day after day with many followers and it's is finding its way to the mass media. And unfortunately, this is having a huge impact uh, on the other people who live in the societies. Uh, maybe who, they come from different background from the Middle East or the third world or Muslim or Arab background, even Asian and African. They are the ones who are impacted uh, uh, largely by this populist rhetoric. Why are we talking about this populist uh, rhetoric by Trump and others? Because all of this will have to be dealt with by the new president. And unfortunately, this legacy, which has been accumulating in the last few years, have impacted us in the Middle East to a large extent. Maybe the first visit made by the American president was to the Gulf and maybe only a few days later, the Gulf crisis came into existence, which we are still suffering from and we are entering into the fourth year of its duration without reaching a dialogue or any launching pads towards a solution in the future. And maybe the fear was that we can wake up one morning with a reality of a new war in this, the area. And the way the American president has been dealing with Iran, which is the largest power in the middle and in the Gulf, was uh, through pushing towards uh, pressure and sanctions has had a huge impact on any dialogue, especially after the withdrawal from the nuclear deal. This makes us and also what other steps that have been taken last year and this year, like uh, the assassinations of Qasem Soleimani and the nuclear scientists now had other consequences and repercussions when we saw uh, missiles coming from the north or the south, whether coming from the Yemen or Iraq or the Iraqi borders, targeting the Gulf and uh, targeting areas considered important. They are strategic areas and the people in the Gulf rely on in their living, in their economy and cannot live without them. This problem, in fact, which was caused by the former president 
And in addition to other challenges, like uh, the way he's been dealing with the economy, the way he's been dealing with the Gulf countries, and also his statements about whether it's about Saudi Arabia or other Gulf countries, there's a lot of, contained a lot of contempt, really. And therefore, all this legacy that the former president is leaving behind will be dealt with with the new president. But it is clear that we are dealing with a president and that uh, th there is uh, a lot of expectation that this area with the presence of Biden will see many great changes and maybe the biggest uh, uh, question posed even by the American media that will Biden really will support new Arab Spring revolutions if they come into existence. These questions and others create an impression about what has happened in the last few years. Biden is not coming from a vacuum. He is not a new president dealing with the He was part of an administration. He was vice president to a former president, that's President Obama. And we saw how that administration dealt with the first wave of the Arab Spring and how they were enthusiastic in the beginning through uh, Barack Obama's famous speech. Uh, and even uh, after uh, he, when he uh, mentioned that in his memoirs, which uh, were published a few days ago, that he was expecting that there will be uh, revolutions or demonstrations but uh, uh, he, he, he did not have a crisis cell to deal with that. Unfortunately, the way the American president has dealt with that was disappointing. And maybe through the support received by the Arab Spring and the revolutions emanating from the streets in Egypt, Libya, and uh, entered into Syria and reached some Gulf countries like Bahrain and Oman, for example, and other countries. All of this, when the, the situation has become that apparently it's moving in a different direction, the American administration has given up on them in a way which saddened as all, so much so that no real changes took place. And uh, we are talking about the Gulf now from 2010 until now. We are in December 2020 and uh, almost one decade, all these revolutions who called for freedom and liberties and uh, especially the ones who emanated from the street and were led by the youth dreaming of a better tomorrow and a better uh, future reached uh, a huge amount of uh, disappointment and maybe the situation now is a lot worse than just before the revolutions and in the last 10 days there were no uh, initiatives uh, uh, from uh, anything by the start, which is initiated by the people and the governments uh, followed. Nothing of the sort, and therefore we see the setback. And I'm sure that Biden in the next four years will deal with different dossiers. The most important is the Iran issue, and he has mentioned that uh, in more than one on more than one occasion since the beginning of his nomination secondly the war in yemen which is un until now represents a big problem because of america's participation in the world thirdly the repositioning in the gulf 
by way of American forces leaving Iraq, the, it makes the issue of Iraq present also, and definitely the Gulf crisis, which is still continuing uh, since 2017 without any prospects of a resolution. Uh, now it's still uh, casting its shadow as on the situation and how can Biden deal with this stratagem? Now we have also is the fact that Israel is becoming part of the area, especially in view of two countries, UAE and Bahrain, normalizing relations. And day after day, we see a continuation of this process without even any slowing down or delays. There's been uh, participation, uh, significant participation at the level of politics, economy, and there will be a new uh, agreement between Bahrain and Israel in the field of uh, tourism and travel, and also the issue of human rights and also uh, the economy. I think the economy will also feature on uh, his agenda, Biden's agenda. If we start with Iran, it is uh, obvious that uh, the area has uh, uh, breathed a sign of relief, a sigh of relief, because of the way uh, dealing with the Iranian issue and the Iranian nuclear issue will be dealt differently by Biden than the way Trump uh, has dealt with it. There will be no more uh, huge pressures. There will no more be uh, sanctions followed by or confrontations. It is obvious that the diplomatic effort will come first. And I'm convinced that these four years will not pass without something being on the table. And Anthony Blinken, the uh, Secretary of State, uh, was the architect of the nuclear deal with Iran. All these indicators show that we are entering into a new area with more rationalism in dealing with this issue in a way which is much better than the previous administration. The other aspect, if we talk about uh, Iran as the largest country in the Gulf, we do not want to go beyond. And uh, I think Iraq, now the problem is uh, there is no consensus, and in view of the presence of American forces, sorry to interrupt, doctor, you have three minutes to finish. This was the important or big problem. I think, uh, will there be a redeployment of the forces withdrawn from Iraq? Will they be redeployed somewhere else in the Gulf? And America under Biden may like to go back on the strategic vision of focusing on China and Russia and focusing on the challenges emanating from there more than the challenges from the Middle East. The other problem is with Iran, Biden uh, and with the uh, I think the war, he means the war in Yemen, Biden will not want America to be part of it with American participation through missiles and that uh, provided it to the warring parties. And uh, maybe there will be some sort of a consensus reached on this uh, dossier. Also for the Gulf crisis, there will be a bigger push towards uh, uh, a dialogue, I think maybe uh, the 
Qatar will be more comfortable with Biden because uh, the margin of maneuvering diplomatically and at the level of the media and the margin of freedom will be better than how things were with Trump in power. As for the human rights, this will also be present, but to what extent can Biden team deal with these issues? I, I don't think they will cut off relations with Egypt over uh, human rights or impose sanctions on some Gulf countries because they are imprisoning women and activists and religious uh, advocates. There will not be big decisions, and I don't think the United States will uh, bypass this huge dilemma uh, that the United States is dealing with. Of course, dealing with Israel will be the ever-present uh, issue. And even before Trump's departure, and especially with the visits now being exchanged and the big push by Europe, I think Biden will continue these efforts uh, to make uh, Gulf countries to do more uh, in, uh, so far as opening up to Iran, maybe Oman or Qatar or other Gulf countries. Now the biggest prize is uh, uh, Saudi Arabia normalizing relations with Israel. And uh, this will be a big change in this regard. What can the Gulf do? This is the final question. The problem in the Gulf is that the Biden and his team coming to a Gulf, this is a new Gulf. The 40 years have changed. The Gulf is no longer as it was today. Every Gulf country has its own uh, uh, interests, whether to do with their own internal, regional, or international issues. And also Turkey, Iran, and Israel are present in the area with their own agendas, which can be conflicting. And maybe there are some uh, reservations in Gulf countries towards these countries. And also the question of security and based on the vision by the GCC, which when it was first founded, is different. Also, American openness with China and Russia and other issues. Thank you very much, Dr. Khalid. I'm sorry to interrupt. We have to leave it here. And maybe we can revisit some of the issues and the questions and answers. And now we give the floor to Dr. Nikolai Kozanov and he will be speaking on the Iran-U.S. tensions and the issue of the Gulf Energy Secretary, Dr. Nikolai. Present your papers and you have between 15 to 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Sheikh uh, Suhaim. Um, I'll try to be brief. Uh, first of all, I would like to um, uh, thank the organizers, the, the Arab Center, for this opportunity to join you today and to share uh, my uh, thoughts on how the evolution or the current evolution of the global uh, oil market is affecting the security dynamics of uh, the Gulf countries. Uh, I also would like to note that it, it, this presentation is a part of a larger research project which is conducted by the uh, Gulf Studies Center of Qatar University on the geopolitics of hydrocarbons. And today I would like to focus uh, on the um, uh, interesting uh, phenomenon uh, of uh, change in the uh, strategy of, of uh, Iran towards uh, the Gulf. Uh, and uh, especially I would like to get focused on the um, uh, economic reasonings for, for this. Uh, as we could see, the last two years were marked with a very interesting change in Iran's uh, approaches to, to the Gulf. Um, and especially within the framework of the ongoing the U.S.-Iranian confrontation. Uh, 
uh, either by uh, its own hands or by the hands of its proxies in the region, Tehran was able to challenge the security of oil supplies and threaten the security of oil infrastructure of some GCC countries. Uh, the most uh, obvious examples of this is definitely the uh, Abkhaik and Khurais incidents uh, of September 2019. It's also the attempt to seize the, the oil tankers uh, during the uh, summer of 2019, but also we should mention that uh, only for uh, the last 30 days uh, the um, oil producing infrastructure of Saudi Arabia uh, was uh, under attack of uh, Houthi rebels for at least three times. Uh, and these uh, dynamics definitely represent a certain shift uh, from the behavior that we saw on the Iranian um, side in the past. At least since 1988 uh, until 2019, Iran was mainly threatening uh, to disrupt the um, uh, oil supplies from the region, uh, if it was determined by the needs to secure to ensuring its national security, but never implemented these threats or never tried to show the, its abilities to to do this. And the reasons here was obviously twofold. On one hand, the major bulk of its oil supplies was going from through the same important transport vein of Strait of Hormuz, and uh, on the other hand. Um, the uh, importance of the region as a supplier of oil for uh, the um, global economy was so high, and especially for the uh, economy of the United States, that definitely any attempts of Iran to really threaten the security of oil supplies and oil exports from the region, they could um, have a certain uh, immediate retaliation for, for the Iranians. They, they could have consequences for, for Iran and for, for its uh, presence in the region. Uh, so this situation basically created two beliefs. On the one hand, uh, there was a certain belief that the U.S. will be able to ensure the security of oil exports from the region at all costs. And uh, partly this belief was based on uh, the U.S. involvement uh, in the uh, liberation of Kuwait in, the in 1990. And um, partly... Doctor, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but um, the... They just got in touch with me. They need you to raise your voice a little bit for the oh, translation, sorry. if possible. Sorry about that. Sorry, absolutely. No, 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 no worries. I, I have this habit, habit to speak in a low voice. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, the um, uh, the, um, uh, the the active involvement of the U.S. Uh, in the Gulf affairs and the declaration that the U.S. was responsible for for the security. Uh, of the experts of hydrocarbons from the region and definitely um, supported the belief that the Americans will be able to get involved into the regional affairs in order to protect the uh, energy supplies. Uh, the second belief that was also um, existing among the, the expert community and policymakers was related to the fact that minor uh, even minor instability uh, e um, political stability that occur in the uh, region is able to affect the situation at the global oil markets and oil prices. However, 2019 it proved that uh, these assumptions are not working anymore, at least to the extent we expect them to work. And this was clearly demonstrated by the events connected to uh, the attacks on uh, Abkhaik and Khurais oil infrastructure. In spite of the fact that uh, the potential Iranian involvement in this case, or at least I'd say connection to uh, the preparation of these attacks, was quite obvious, uh, there was almost no um, uh, impact either for uh, Iran in terms of the potential American reaction, nor for the markets. Uh, the uh, uh, short-living hike in oil prices was soon uh, disappearing, which was uh, basically showing that on the one hand the economic realities has uh, substantially changed, and on the other hand uh, the U.S. is ready to tolerate to a certain extent the uh, Iranian behavior um, uh, towards the um, uh, GCC countries if it's connected to the certain uh, threat created for uh, the functioning of the oil uh, industry and for the um, uh, continuation of the oil exports from, from the region. Uh, but uh, what's the most important is the question actually why this change uh, happened. 
So the most ob obvious answer is uh, that uh, Iran is got uh, less dependent on uh, the exports of oil from the Strait of Hormuz because of the sanctions uh, almost completely cut it from oil market and the fact that Iran substantially progressed in building up the oil infrastructure that uh, theoretically since 2021 uh, will allow it to bypass the uh, exports of uh, oil um, to, to, to bypass the, 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 the Strait of Hormuz and become less dependent on uh, the exports of oil from uh, these um, geographical area, uh, they are not working properly uh, because the full picture is becoming more obvious when we take into account uh, the economic uh, dimension, namely uh, the changes that uh, took place in the global oil market. First of all, uh, it is the uh, shale oil revolution that uh, turned the United States in the uh, global oil uh, producer and uh, exporter. So it was basically changing uh, its motivations in terms of uh, towards the, 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 the Gulf region, uh, making it less interested and less dependent, uh, less interested in the uh, security of this region and less dependent on the uh, oil supplies, and moreover turning it to a certain extent and other uh, regional markets arrival of uh, the uh, Gulf producers. Uh, on the top of it, uh, it could be added that uh, the uh, um, uh, other consumers, especially uh, the European consumers, they uh, became quite active in implementing global uh, energy transition to uh, um, uh, going away from, from fuels uh, that uh, increasing the emissions of uh, CO2. And that naturally also was decreasing the importance of uh, oil as an um, energy resource for the economies. And finally, it's not a factor, but rather a uh, catalyst, the, the COVID pandemic was uh, additionally an auxiliary uh, decreasing the demand on oil in oil, but um, uh, still um, at the situation when the uh, production level was remaining stable, which also was leading to the active uh, and intensive competition for uh, the markets between the Gulf uh, oil producers uh, and uh, both traditional conventional producers and the, the new players that emerged during the uh, shale uh, revolution, which was naturally creating a wide selection of sources of supplies uh, for the consumers, thus uh, creating also an alternative uh, to the Gulf uh, and decreasing uh, the vision of importance of this region for uh, the others. Finally, the global oversupply, uh, it naturally led to the decrease of in the incomes of the uh, GCC or oil producers. And as we could see since 2015 uh, and until nowadays, um, the uh, uh, economic growth of these countries has never been re has never reached the um, uh, growth rates that existed before uh, the first crisis um, caused by uh, actually the uh, oil supply uh, boosted by shale revolution, uh, which naturally makes the um, these countries quite sensitive uh, to all infrastructure insecurity that could em emerge in the Gulf because it was definitely a affecting uh, the ability to accumulate the financial incomes if any disruptions in the oil experts occurs. And B, it was also affecting the behavior of the traditional consumers that uh, in case of uh, substantial threats to the uh, their supplies, they could just change a supply in these uh, conditions. Uh, in other words, uh, all these uh, changes in the global oil market, they uh, made a substantial um, shift in our understanding of the uh, Gulf uh, uh, energy security. If uh, previously it was the security of supply, so when the international community, due to the importance of this region, was interested in ensuring its own access to the Gulf resources, now it became the security of demand when the producers themselves are compelled to ensure and to guarantee their access to the market, which uh, absolutely uh, changes uh, the whole dy dynamic, political dynamics for Iran, uh, making uh, the GCC countries represent a ideal leverage of uh, influence over uh, the United States. So, relatively to who is going to uh, occupy 
uh, the White House for the next uh, four years, these countries are definitely uh, remaining uh, the ally of the United States. But at the same time, the ally whose security is probably less important uh, than uh, the security of um, the US other partner, Israel. And it was clearly demonstrated again after the Abkhaic incident when the United States basically showed no reaction to uh, the uh, Iran-supported Houthi attacks on the uh, oil infrastructure of Saudi Arabia. But on the other hand, they reacted actively in, December, uh, in January uh, 2021 uh, by uh, killing uh, General Qasem Soleimani, which was largely considered as a revenge uh, for uh, the uh, death of the U.S. citizen during the Iran, uh, during the attacks on the uh, American infrastructure in Iraq, uh, staged by the Iranian proxies. So this was, this was clearly showing that the red line, which Iran shouldn't uh, cross for uh, the U.S., it changed. It was not no more uh, uh, the lives of uh, the GCC citizens or the, the security of the GCC infrastructure, but rather the lives of the American citizens presenting in the region. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, these uh, partners of the US, they, they're becoming uh, vulnerable uh, and uh, quite uh, vulnerable to, to, to the further American, sorry, Iranian behavior in the region. So the pressure on them is quite possible, and that's what Iran is uh, currently doing by the hands of uh, its proxies. Uh, by putting additional pressure on the GCC countries, Iran is definitely uh, showing the United States that their partners uh, are in the reach of Iran. It also uh, prevents uh, trying to, 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 to prevent the uh, GCC countries from following or actively supporting anti-Iranian uh, moves in the region. And again, it was clearly demonstrated by the fact that uh, the GCC monarchies were, uh, were quite uh, quick um, uh, to uh, uh, establish active contacts with, with Iran after the assassination of Qasem Soleimani. And the uh, Emirates, in spite of uh, quite uh, um, positive dynamics in their relations with Israel, were among the first uh, actually to um, uh, condemn the assassination of the uh, Iranian scientist uh, Fahri Zadeh. Uh, and finally, it's also uh, creating, uh, helps to, 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 to create the split uh, inside the GCC countries, as it was uh, clearly formulated during the first day of our uh, you know, for forum by one of the participants. Uh, the GCC are not unanimous uh, about the uh, policy towards Iran, and there, there are countries that are quite pragmatic in terms of the building up relations uh, with uh, Tehran and how they, they, they should be designed further. Uh, so, uh, wrapping up, we could say that definitely oil uh, and the situation in the oil markets, it suddenly created a certain opportunities for, uh, for Iran to express, uh, exercise additional uh, pressure both on the GCC and, uh, and the US. And moreover, given that the uh, long-term perspectives are not saying about any substantial improvement, evolution or changes uh, in the situation in the market that could, for instance, bring the situation back to the pre 2019, or better to say pre-2015 uh, situation, we could say that uh, these opportunities will continue to exist and Iran might exploit them uh, in case of necessity, but also uh, under the condition that it will be still watching certain limits and not, 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 not crossing them than uh, conducting operations in the region. Uh, thank you very much. My, my Watches are showing me that I was speaking 15 minutes. I guess it's more than enough, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. And um, uh, uh, now we will move on to Doctor Imad Qadura. Doctor Imad, she will present a paper with the Dr. Imad Qadura uh, will be talking about external initiatives for the security system in the Gulf. Dr. Qadura, the floor is yours. Doctor, you're still uh, on mute mode. Your microphone is muted. Thank you. Uh, Sheikh uh, Sohem for uh, this introduction and I would I would like to thank the Arab Center. Can you hear me? Uh, 
accent. So, my paper is entitled External Initiatives for the Security System in the Gulf, uh, the United States, uh, uh, Russia, China, India, and Pakistan. But we can also talk about the most important uh, uh, points. Uh, I will try to uh, talk for only 15 minutes. Uh, the Gulf region uh, has always been subject to the intervention uh, by foreign forces because of the disputes and the tension at the security level and the competition between the main powers. And Dr. Nikolai talked in details about this. And uh, also in light of the uh, geopolitical uh, importance of this region, this tension led to uh, the strengthening of uh, foreign powers presence and military bases and uh, the uh, gains and benefits of these countries, the increasing tension could result in threatening uh, these uh, infrastructure, especially when it comes to the free flow of uh, uh, commodities. This, uh, uh, leads us to talking about uh, different uh, approaches. Uh, the first approach uh, when it comes to Gulf security talks about the necessity of a balance of power in order to guarantee uh, the interests uh, through the policies of uh, alliances and the strengthening of the uh, military partnerships. The second approach uh, is uh, the global security that uh, is founded on uh, relations that are non-confrontational in the region and uh, presumes that uh, the security is going to be guaranteed for all countries and cooperation is necessary when it comes to energy, uh, trade, security, and also the military aspects in order to reach a security context between different parties. The global security uh, option uh, relies on uh, the non-use of uh, violence and uh, uh, setting up institutions uh, uh, that uh, call for peaceful uh, conflict uh, uh, resolution and a comprehensive approach for cooperation. It is important to uh, give an overview uh, regarding the initiatives uh, of the two parties for the uh, global security or collective security in the Gulf, Saudi Arabia and Iran. When it comes to Saudi Arabia, in addition to the balance of power uh, through the uh, establishment of the GCC and strengthening of the military relationships with the West, especially the United States, the most important initiative for global or for collective security was suggested by Prince Saud Faisal in 2004, at the end of uh, the Mohammed Khatami term. He called for a regional context that includes all countries in the region, and Tehran had to uh, commit to cooperating and refrain from meddling in other countries' affairs, and this uh, was to be supported by the Security Council. However, the latest tensions uh, led to an increasing conflict and uh, reducing the possibility of implementing this initiative. For Iran, the most important three initiatives were in 2007, the 10-point plan that was proposed by Rouhani when he was the representative of uh, the Supreme Leader and the initiative of Jawad uh, Zarif in 2015, the uh, collective forum and the initiative of President Hassan Rouhani in 2019, which is the uh, latest one. These uh, initiatives uh, all call for a context for uh, collective cooperation, including all countries in the Gulf under the umbrella of the United Nations and the withdrawal of all foreign forces and strengthening the regional uh, affair, uh, relations with all its aspects. Uh, for Iran, uh, practically speaking, uh, uh, Iran focused on uh, the arm race and uh, the balance of power. We start with important uh, foreign initiatives for Gulf security. We can talk about the most important one by the United States of America. Uh, th throughout the uh, last decade, uh, the Obama and Trump administrations disagreed regarding the uh, involvement of Iran and the Gulf. Uh, it was all in the service of the uh, U.S. interests and the plan of gradual withdrawal. None of them uh, announced uh, they were committed uh, uh, 
vis-a-vis -vis this uh, security structure in the Gulf. Uh, the Obama administration tried to expand the participation of Iran through negotiations and the JCPOA signed in 2015 was an opportunity to uh, take this first step towards a system that could improve the region's uh, relations and reduce the military commitment by uh, the US and also control Iranian uh, behavior regionally and internationally. Of course, Saudi Arabia was against the nuclear deal and uh, any rapprochement between the United States and Iran and uh, could uh, go back to the Nixon principle and uh, 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 the, uh, it was uh, based uh, on uh, Iran mainly. The uh, signing of the nuclear deal uh, uh, encouraged uh, uh, some uh, uh, US uh, ac ac academics uh, to uh, propose uh, another context uh, like uh, ASEAN and uh, other uh, initiatives. Uh, but uh, the fact that uh, Trump won the elections in 2016 uh, led uh, to the fact that these uh, suggestions uh, were difficult to achieve. Uh, for Iran, uh, for the Trump administration, Dr. Raymond, please, uh, could you uh, speak closer to the, into the microphone? Raise your voice, please. So uh, when it comes to the uh, Trump administration, it uh, chose a confrontation in order to impose uh, new uh, conditions on Iran. The United States withdrew from the JCPOA and uh, uh, used the maximum pressure uh, campaign in order to renegotiate the deal and worked on uh, regional mechanisms in order to strengthen military uh, alliances and uh, create new coalitions in order to isolate Iran, the strategic uh, uh, Middle East Mesa uh, in 2017, the or what was called the Arab uh, NATO after the U.S. Uh, Islamic Summit in Riyadh in May 2017. That alliance or that coalition included the GCC countries, the six countries in addition to Egypt, Jordan, and the United States. And uh, the uh, other coalition was the International Coalition for the Protection of the Maritime uh, uh, Movement in 2019 in Bahrain to include the US, uh, GCC, except uh, for Oman, and uh, uh, Australia and uh, other countries. With the Biden administration, we could uh, back to the Obama approach, but it might be challenging because Iran uh, rejects the expansion of the uh, deal and uh, the negotiations uh, when it comes to ballistic uh, missiles and its rights uh, to expand uh, its uh, missile arsenal and anything uh, that is agreed upon with the Biden administration could be uh, uh, put to an end by a new administration, just like what happened uh, uh, during the transition from Obama to Trump. This is uh, when it comes to the US. As to Russia, it was the only country uh, with a detailed, clear initiative in order to create a security system in the Gulf based on global security. In light of its rising involvement in the uh, regional and international affairs and uh, its involvement in the Gulf and present its uh, military arsenal as an alternative, Russia suggested uh, uh, cooperation at the level of uh, security in the Gulf. Uh, and uh, it was suggested uh, or proposed to the Security Council. So this is important. Russia uh, suggested uh, this initiative uh, at the level of the Security Council in order to get international legitimacy. And we will uh, talk in detail about that. In July 2019, and in October 2020. The uh, initiative is lengthy, but the most important uh, texts were 
creating a security regime in the Gulf through a long term uh, program in order to normalize the, uh, relation, the relations and uh, strengthen stability and security. And uh, there was a focus on global security throughout uh, the security fields to include the economy, energy, and uh, military and uh, it would start uh, by finding solutions to the most pressing problems with the alliance of all countries uh, against terrorism and guarantee a political solution in syria and other places uh, the coalition against terrorism suggested that uh, saudi arabia and iran agree on sponsoring uh, terrorism but uh, each country accuses the other uh, of uh, sponsoring terrorism and when it comes to multi-dimensional approach or multilateral approach uh, uh, russia uh, insists on the implementation of all agreements uh, uh, regarding the nuclear deal of uh, nuclear program of uh, iran without uh, foreign meddling and uh, putting together a group to uh, prepare for an international uh, conference uh, for uh, security and uh, uh, co cooperation, uh, just like uh, the one in uh, Europe, and uh, establishing a number of measures. Uh, uh, the most important one, the refusal of uh, any foreign military presence uh, to include the United States, and this starts uh, by reducing the military presence. Uh, Russia presents itself as a guarantor of uh, security of the Gulf, uh, and Russia is uh, ready to cooperate in order to guarantee the security of Gulf countries. There were different uh, responses. Of course, Iran welcomed this initiative because it is in line with its initiatives, and the two countries agree that the security system need to include uh, all Gulf countries without exclusion and uh, the withdrawal of foreign forces and having an international conference for the security of the Gulf under the umbrella of the United Nations and paving the way for uh, this security system by confidence uh, or trust building mechanisms that, that could lead to uh, conflict resolution. The Gulf uh, countries did not or were not interested in this initiative. And when Russia suggested the first uh, initiative in 2019 and 2020, uh, I actually looked and uh, there was no official Gulf response to this initiative. And maybe because they were not uh, satisfied. Uh, the United States completely rejected this initiative and uh, the uh, uh, ambassador Kraft to the United Nations uh, uh, talked about the, the violation of international law and uh, the lack of necessity of a new mechanism uh, regarding security in the Gulf. But also Russia has the veto uh, right uh, at the level of the Security Council. Russia is interested of getting this international legitimacy, which means that uh, Russia would have the right to uh, replace uh, uh, Washington and the Gulf or prevent the uh, any military action by the United States and the Gulf. And uh, American researchers talk about uh, uh, the potential uh, dialogue uh, um, between the different parties. Uh, uh, according to the United States, uh, uh, the U.S. needs to uh, guarantee uh, these negotiations and Russia uh, cannot. This is the only official initiative suggested for uh, security structure in the Gulf. The approach of China, I do not say initiative, but the approach of China vis-a-vis Gulf security, uh, China considered that uh, uh, on the short term, it is difficult to achieve uh, the security uh, structure uh, and China does not want to get involved in regional conflicts, but China seeks to protect its increasing interests in the Gulf. In addition to its reliance on Gulf from uh, on energy from the Gulf, trade with uh, trade uh, with the countries increased, and we can say that the uh, trade uh, 
in 1990 was 1.5 billion dollars and now it's more than 250 billion us dollars and trade increased between 2005 and 2013 for instance by 400 percent this is why the movement by china in the region lately is based on this uh, uh, fact and uh, uh, since it is uh, a rising uh, or uh, state uh, or power, it needs to have a role uh, in the region. The uh, first uh, move by uh, China was presenting the Ch uh, the China's uh, Arab policy paper in uh, 2016. This paper sheds light on the development strategies in the region and the uh, fact that China could cooperate uh, in general, but without referring to uh, Iran, uh, this paper included the GCC um, in terms of a strategic dialogue between the two parties. Uh, Xi Jinping in 2016 visited the Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Iran. During this visit, uh, the uh, president uh, uh, discussed bilateral relations and not uh, the uh, collective uh, or uh, multilateral relations. And uh, despite the fact that uh, we're talking about January 2016, where tensions were increasing between Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, China refused to play the role of a moderator. Uh, of a, uh, excuse me, of a mediator between the two countries, and uh, the uh, Chinese president delivered uh, a lecture in uh, Cairo, at the headquarters of the Arab League, uh, in which he presented the vision of China for security and stability. Dr. Ahmad, three minutes, please. Thank you. So the most important uh, thing in this uh, statement was that uh, China rejects the use of power and uh, the uh, influence uh, region mentality and the long term Chinese approach by uh, creating this cooperation pattern. Uh, so one, two, three pattern. First of all, energy in addition to infrastructure and facilitation of uh, trade and investments and representing uh, the uh, uh, state of the art technology uh, for uh, nuclear technologies and uh, new uh, energy sources uh, need to be included so this is the Chinese approach uh, that does not include uh, the military aspect uh, and it is directed towards the Arab region in general, not necessarily the Gulf. And uh, uh, the uh, statement focused on uh, solutions from within. China hosted in 2019 a uh, conference uh, without uh, presenting uh, practical uh, suggestions. China wants to uh, preserve its vital interests, uh, avoiding the uh, security involvement in the Gulf, uh, including uh, among the biggest 10 exporter, exp exporting countries to China. Uh, most of them are Gulf countries uh, in addition to Iran. China also avoids being perceived uh, as a competitor to the West and the Gulf. Despite that, China cannot disregard the security issue in the Gulf, despite the absence of uh, official initiative. And uh, the uh, strategic patience, uh, the uh, great patience of uh, China on the long term focuses on uh, creating an increasing relationship uh, and the Road and Belt uh, Initiative and is also another initiative that uh, allows China in the future to uh, suggest uh, new initiatives. Currently, GCC are not uh, 
from a geographic uh, perspective, part of this road. But Iran, uh, when it comes to uh, the geography, uh, the uh, geographic aspect is important to this road, and especially the railways uh, uh, from China uh, to Tehran, talking about uh, 9,000 uh, plus uh, kilometers of railways. So the in uh, the continuation of the tension caused uh, uh, the lack of uh, uh, links uh, between the Gulf countries. We need to remember that China is building the biggest trade road in the world uh, and it will have uh, links with uh, economic hubs all over the world. The president of China, Xi Jinping, during his visit to Saudi Arabia, uh, highlighted the fact that uh, the GCC countries want to be linked with this project. And this strengthens the scenario that says that China in the future will be an interested uh, party in this security, global security of the Gulf. But uh, China has a long-term patience. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmad. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmad. Who will speak about institution and policy in, um, in institutional policy in Iran relations with the GCC um, and uh, doctor, uh, you have between 15 and 20 minutes. Um, please go ahead and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sheikh Hossein. It's a pleasure and an honor being here, uh, particularly uh, being a panelist with such uh, distinguished colleagues. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, we heard uh, three excellent presentations that uh, focused on uh, various aspects of international relations. Uh, in relation to the U.S. foreign policy and its potential directions under the Biden presidency, uh, Iran, Russia, and uh, the energy dimension, and uh, finally by Dr. Imad, and uh, the very perceptive and insightful comments on China. I want to turn our attention uh, for a minute on to domestic Iranian politics, uh, but particularly in terms of policy making. Uh, Iranian policy uh, in general and its uh, policy making in relation to the GCC is subject to tremendous guesswork and opacity. This is largely because the institutions that are responsible within Iran for making foreign policy, uh, specifically in relation to the GCC, are not necessarily well known and uh, we don't necessarily know what happens inside the black box of the Iranian state. So what I would like to do for uh, 10 or 15 minutes is to first and foremost look at the institutional mechanisms through which Iranian policy is made. What are some of the uh, consequences of that policy and how Iranian policy plays itself out? And then lastly, what are some of the constraints, institutional and structural constraints that uh, Iranian policy is played out within? So what's the larger context within which Iranian policy in relation to the GCC is made? There are three primary foreign policy centers in Iran. And I had assumed up until research for this uh, uh, paper, that uh, Iranian policy in the GCC or Iranian foreign policy in general tends to be contradictory. But I have discovered actually that Iranian foreign policy and security policy tend to be a product of compromises, bargains, and give and take processes within institutions inside the Islamic Republic. The three institutions and the three centers of gravity within Iran that make foreign policy are not necessarily equal, but nonetheless, all three of them are consequential and important. They include first and foremost, the executive, namely the presidency and the foreign policy establishment. 
Second, the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps or the IRGC. And then third and most important, the office of the leader, the leader. And so let me spend a minute talking about each of these in particular. Now we know that Iranian uh, foreign policy, of course, has uh, the foreign minister as the spokesperson. Uh, oftentimes uh, we hear from Riyadh, for example, or even Abu Dhabi, that it's not the Iranian foreign policy establishment that makes foreign policy, but it's the IRGC. Nonetheless, we know that at least theoretically and the broad outlines of Iranian foreign policy are often articulated and devised by the Iranian foreign policy establishment. There is, of course, that other second institution that has input uh, in Iranian foreign policy, namely the IRGC. IRGC is actually legally, constitutionally in charge of Iranian security policy, both domestically and internationally. We know that Iran's border policies in particular are the purview of the IRGC. IRGC has gone through a number of generational changes. The first generation that uh, constituted the IRGC in the aftermath of the Iranian revolution was ideologically committed to the ideals of the Islamic revolution. Usually they came from lower middle class or lower class backgrounds and they, they joined as volunteers rather than as professional soldiers. Second generation came uh, in the era of reconstruction, once the war ended, once the first generation basically retired at the end of the war in 1989 or 1990, and the second generation of IRGC commanders came, they were really opportunists. These were businessmen at heart, and they, uh, interestingly, in 1997, overwhelmingly voted, by some accounts, 73% of them voted for the reformist Mohammad Khatami as president. This prompted Ayatollah Khamenei to direct the commanders of the IRGC to ensure the forces ideological loyalty and its uh, commitment to the ideals of the Islamic revolution. And as a result, in the year 2000, the IRGC went through a process of change whereby it once again became ideologically highly committed. And at the same time, it underwent a process of professionalization. And that is the third generation that is currently um, uh, in charge of IRGC and uh, it's the, that third generation that uh, we see. The, these are two of the centers, the presidency and the IRGC that rel have relatively equal amounts of power. At least they are equally the less po uh, powerful of the three partners. Ultimately, the decision is made by Khamenei, the, uh, the leader. Um, or what Western journalists mistakenly call the supreme leader. There is no such term in Farsi. It's actually called uh, the leader. Khamenei's position himself has gone through important fundamental changes. Up until 2009, the president uh, uh, was by far the more powerful institution within this triumvirate. And the office of the leadership was really involved in some key issues, namely relations with the United States and the nuclear question. During the presidency of Ahmadinejad, in, uh, and specifically the second term of Ahmadinejad presidency, once Khamenei had to intervene in the aftermath of the contested presidential election, he became far more directly involved in the exercise of power and in the day-to-day -day running of the government. He wasn't just now in charge of the overall direction of the Islamic system. He became an active participant in the political process. And what we see is after 2009, Khamenei has become far more involved in domestic uh, political processes, but also far more importantly in relation to our discussion today 
in Iranian foreign policy in setting the direction and the guidelines of the Iranian foreign policy. Ideologically, Khamenei falls somewhere in uh, uh, to the right of center of the Iranian ideological spectrum. But I think it is fundamentally important for us to keep in mind that Khamenei is ultimately a pragmatist. He actually said very blatantly in a public speech that if it is in the interests of the system, Nizam, I am willing to negotiate with the Americans. And we see again and again, he has stayed away and he has given himself cover and he has endorsed what the president has done. He has endorsed what the IRGC has done. And at the last strategic moment, he has given himself plausible deniability. For example, he endorsed the nuclear negotiations, but once the United States pulled out, he came out and said, well, I always knew that the Americans couldn't be trusted. So we see that Khamenei has been acting in a very pragmatic um, manner, but it is also important to keep in mind that nothing happens in Iran without his direct blessing, that the presidency or the foreign minister does not initiate uh, something in relation to Saudi Arabia or the IRGC doesn't poke at the Saudis um, without the Supreme Leader's blessing or at least his implicit green light. And so there are these three power centers. How does Iranian foreign policy manifest itself, particularly when it comes in, uh, in relation to uh, the Gulf region? There are four broad baskets of concern that Iran has when it comes to uh, its immediate environment, and in particular, when it comes to uh, the GCC. First and foremost, Iranian foreign and security policies are made based on balance of power calculations. What is the balance of power and where does Iran fit in relation to this balance of power? And when it comes to the balance of power, Iran, at least in Tehran's calculations, is fully aware or bases its policies on the fact that the GCC is not an independent actor. The GCC in Iran's eyes is highly security dependent on the United States, particularly in relation to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is not seen by Tehran as an independent foreign policy or security policy actor. And in order to act and deal with the Saudis, Iran assumes it needs to go through the United States, that the only language that the Saudis are willing to listen to is the language coming out of Washington. And it was this understanding that prompted Iran, one of the calculations was to engage in the 2015 uh, nuclear negotiations. And in many ways, Iran was dumbfounded when it was confronted with the GCC's rather negative reaction or the Saudi's negative reaction, because it said, if we alleviate the Americans security concerns, why is the GCC not necessarily uh, uh, coming along. A second basket of concern that Iran has is the legacy of the Iran-Iraq war. I think oftentimes in looking at Iran's foreign and security policies, we ignore the heavy weight, the dark weight of the legacy of the Iran-Iraq war. That A, every one of the GCC countries rushed to Iraq's support to the tune of tens of billions of dollars when it came to Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, and B, nobody was willing to help Iran procure weapons. The only ones who were willing to sell Iran weapons were the Israelis, of course, at a premium price. And this is what is driving Iran's missile program. The fact that Iran is alone, or at least in Tehran's eyes, uh, Iran is alone. Nobody is going to uh, come to its help at a time of need. And this is what is driving Iran's ballistic missile program as a pure deterrent and uh, insurance policy uh, for when uh, war happens. Related to this is a third dimension of Iran's security policy, which is asymmetric warfare. Iran is fully aware that it cannot beat 
the GCC and uh, or the United States when it comes to a conventional warfare. And therefore, Iran has to, by definition, by nature, engage in asymmetric warfare, whereby local commanders are given complete autonomy to act on their own without getting uh, authorization from Tehran uh, or from any headquarters, uh, regional or national. They can act on their own. Uh, and of course, uh, once uh, command and um, control operations are severed, local commanders have complete autonomy of decision making. We saw incidentally in January of uh, this year, this had a tragic consequence whereby a local commander decided to fire and it just so happened that he fired on a Ukrainian passenger jetliner. But this is a, a manifestation of Iran's asymmetric warfare mentality, whereby Iran is going to do whatever it takes to defend itself. And this is uh, one of the calculations in uh, Tehran's security policy. And related to this asymmetric warfare is a fourth dimension of Iran's policy, which is relationship with non-state actors, relationship with regional militia actors. And of course, if Iran cannot have official allies, it can at least have unofficial allies in the form of non-state actors and militias. And we see this in uh, relation to um, Iraq, in relation to Syria, and particularly in relation, interestingly, uh, in relation to Iran's recruitment of the Fatimiyun and the Zainabiyun brigades uh, of Pakistani and uh, Af Afghan uh, militia to fight in Syria. And, and this is, uh, of course, an interesting development. Now, what are the institutions in which these four dimensions of Iranian policy find themselves? First of all, what we see in Rouhani administration, and this is something that Dr. Ahmad mentioned, is the pursuit of the so-called hormos peace endeavor, hope, which has no takers. And the question that Iran is asking is, why are there no takers? Khamenei articulated this in uh, the United Nations. Uh, it was, uh, sorry, Rouhani did. Rouhani followed this up by writing letters to the King of Saudi Arabia, King of Bahrain, inviting them to join the Hormuz peace endeavors. And there have been no takers. Nobody has uh, gone for this. And the question is why? Question of why this is the case is because of the structure, the structural makeup of security architecture in the GCC and in the Gulf environment. And we see three dominant features to the security architecture whereby Iranian, um, uh, Iranian overtures to the GCC fall on deaf ears. First of all, there's the American security umbrella. And you might, we read just day, uh, the day before that uh, President Trump instructed Secretary Pompeo to give Iran hell in the remaining weeks of his presidency short of World War III. Uh, give Iran hell uh, uh, in the remaining timetable of the Trump presidency short of World War III. So the American security umbrella has been designed to bring Iran to its knees, whether it is through assassinations or if it's through maximum pressure campaign or whatever means there might be available. Second is what we have seen per pervasive in the architecture of the region after 2011, which is the tremendous sectarianization of the GCC. What we see is that both Tehran and regional capitals, whether it is uh, Kuwait or Manama or Riyadh or Abu Dhabi or even Doha, tend to perceive of the rest of the region through sectarian eyes. And so what we see is that sectarianism, the fact that Iran is now perceived after 2011 as the Shia other and that it is, it is uh, hell-bent on uh, 
wreaking mischief and wreaking havoc on the Sunni Arab population, that sectarian outlook tends to cloud the lens through which security policy is perceived, both from Tehran and from regional capitals. And last Dr. but Dr. Mehran, just uh, to let you know, uh, three minutes uh, are there. Thank you. Thank you, very much. Thank you Sheikh Sohim. Last but by no means least is the pervasive security dilemma. Every day we see that there is a new record uh, weapons sale, whether it is by Saudi Arabia or by the United Arab Emirates or the Iranians on, uh, uh, um, unleash a new or uh, they, um, they uh, show off a new weapon system. And so there's this pervasive security dilemma and therefore, as a result, what we have is this dialogue coming out of Tehran and dialogue coming out of elsewhere, security concerns that go nowhere. We have these security concerns that really don't necessarily talk to each other. So what does this mean? We have more questions, really, than we have answers. By way of conclusions, where do we go from here? I think... Uh, uh, it's really difficult to tell what the, where the Biden administration is going to come down on. I sincerely doubt if there's any appetite on the part of the, or at least if there is any political capital that Biden is willing to spend, given the Iranophobia that is pervasive in the United States to enhance relations with Iran in the near future. Certainly, Tehran has no appetite. There, there is no political capital by anybody to enter into or renegotiate the nuclear agreement with the Americans. Just uh, yesterday, the Iranian Majlis uh, passed the bill uh, or, or proposed a bill whereby Iran would uh, increase uh, nuclear enrichment and would get rid of the IAEA inspectors. Uh, following the assassination. And so what we have is continued tensions in the future and where the chips fall is anybody's guess. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, doctor. And um, uh, we will, uh, as I mentioned to you before, start with you uh, for the Q&A. And we have a very timely question on how will the Iranian GCC relations uh, um, be impacted by the new entry of Israel into the region? And I would like to begin with to address that uh, question to you, Dr. Uh, Mehran. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Cer certainly, this is something that the Iranians are strategically concerned about. If uh, the um, uh, if the weapons sale that the UAE has asked for uh, goes through, and now that the relationship between um, UAE and um, Bahrain uh, that has existed with Israel, now that it has become official, uh, then of course uh, the, there's a different uh, strategic calculus. This will only perpetuate the security dilemma uh, as far as Tehran is concerned and these countries are concerned. I, uh, uh, I'll stop here, but let me just mention that this normalization, we shouldn't make too much of it. It's nothing new. This has been happening. These countries have been, each of the GCC countries have been tripping over themselves to ingratiate themselves with Israel in order to deepen and buttress their relationship with the Americans. And and they have only given official recognition to what has really been happening for a good number of years already. We know, for example, that Israeli software companies have been selling spy software up and down the GCC to all the countries concerned. So this normalization only makes official a process of mutual flirting that has been happening for years, and the Iranians have been fully aware of it. If this now then assumes dimensions of military collaboration and military cooperation, that changes the strategic calculus in Tehran. And, and then it will further perpetuate the security dilemma that has existed. 
ثانك يو فيري ماتش دكتور انا طبعا لان ورقه الدكتور عماد ايضا كوز دكتور عماد بيبر هاد ا سكيورتي اسبكت اند ذيس از ا كويستشن ريليتينغ تو ذا سكيورتي اي وونت تو جيف دكتور عماد ذا كويستشن تو ريسبوند تو ذا كويستشن اوف اسرائيلز انتري انتو ذا ريجن اند ذا سكيورتي موفمنتس اند هاو كان ذيس امباكت ايران's ريليشنز وذ ذا جي سي سي Yes, thank you very much. Iran's relations, uh, we must uh, understand that Israel's entry into the region was not, uh, was not something that happened today. They had strong relations between Iran with Israel in the days of the Shah, and that has meant that the balance of power was tilting towards Iran and then the, when the Gulf countries stood by Iraq, uh, this caused uh, the ten- Iranian-Israeli relations with an element of tension. Now what we see now is that there is normalization between the Gulf countries and Israel and Iran is on the other side of the fence. This would increase and exacerbate the tension, as Dr. Mahran has said, because the security dilemma will be exasperated and also uh, uh, the tendency to settle uh, things in a matter which is acceptable from a security point of view will not be that easy. This is mainly what I have to say about this. Thank you, Dr. Imad. Now we have three hands raised. To join, to ask their questions directly. And Dr. David, I would like to comment with you, please. So please go ahead with your comments. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I just want to pile on uh, with Mehran's points. There's two other reasons for Iran to have a missile program. The first is coup proofing. Um, Hafiz al-Assad came to power as uh, an Air Force officer. And when you look at the coups of the period, Air Force officers were there because it's easy to move Army officers around. They don't have to be trained as much as Air Force officers. Air Force officers, particularly pilots, remain in place. They can't be moved or replaced easily. And so they can form a thing. A missile operator is more like an army officer. They can be moved around, they're operators, they can be replaced, uh, treated almost as mechanical parts. And so it's much harder to have a coup led by missile officers. There's never been one. The second is just cost. It is so much cheaper to to develop a strike capacity with ballistic missiles. Uh, And the cost of missiles and of accurizing missiles is falling uh, as a corollary of Moore's law of computer memory. It is exponentially falling, whereas the price of manned strike aircraft is exponentially rising. So uh, I just want to throw those two into the mix. There are tactical and financial reasons for this as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. David. We move to Dr. Khalil Jahshan. Dr. Khalil, please go ahead. Thank you, Sheikh Suhaim, and thank you to all our colleagues, the panelists in this session, this valuable session. And thank you for all your excellent uh, presentations, Dr. Khalid, Nikolai, Imad, Mehran. Thank you all. My question is directed to my colleague and my friend, Dr. Khalid, you mentioned in your presentation that the situation in the Gulf is no longer uh, how it was before the crisis, the Gulf crisis, and I agree with you entirely. But let's suppose that the current attempt by Kushner aimed at reconciliation between Riyadh and Doha was doomed in failure and the situation will be left to Biden to initiate a new effort of mediation between the parties. What are the CBMs uh, that we can 
that can be taken to build confidence. What kind of uh, such uh, steps can be taken to enable us to bypass the current impasse in the Gulf relations? I would like to thank you, uh, doctor. And there's also an intervention by Dr. Mohanna. Dr. Mohanna, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Sheikh Suhaim. I would like to thank you and thank the Arab Center. And uh, I would like to thank everybody for their interventions. I would like to uh, add uh, uh, something uh, to uh, the valuable uh, papers that were presented by uh, our colleagues. I would like to highlight uh, the other aspect of the position of the uh, GCC countries when it comes to the Trump era and the post-Trump era. Uh, so uh, is there an important space that affected the uh, uh, security of the Gulf, the bilateral relations, the social aspect, and the general national interests in the Gulf uh, based on the changes from within? Yes, I say yes, there is a major change. It is true that the previous uh, administration uh, committed a big uh, uh, crime uh, when it comes to the green light vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis this Gulf crisis, but also there was a change at the level of the influence in Saudi Arabia and also the role of Abu Dhabi. I would like to highlight, highlight uh, Biden's uh, statement uh, when he announced members uh, of uh, his cabinet uh, and uh, he's starting to shape up the foreign policy of his administration. Biden said the America that was known uh, all over the world will be back. What about the America that we know in the Gulf? The influence will be limited uh, on the policies of GCC countries. This is why I would like to focus on the self-behavior of states and are there any opportunities for a change uh, uh, when it comes to the behavior of Saudi Arabia. I would like to highlight two things. The first is the bilateral negotiations uh, are ongoing with Doha, although there is uh, an objection uh, every now and then by Abu Dhabi, but this context is ongoing. The second thing is the message that was sent uh, by Riyadh to Turkey to uh, calm uh, uh, social media uh, attacks uh, on Turkey and I would like to say that if there is an agreement that uh, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia adopted a policy based on the tweet of uh, the uh, people on social media. There was a slight change lately because uh, now we have professionals. Are these professionals uh, capable, for example, the new foreign uh, minister. So, uh, are uh, these professionals capable of changing the foreign policy and uh, uh, move forward in the negotiations uh, with Doha? Uh, Sheikh Sahim, uh, uh, with all due respect, uh, and I think this needs to be tackled, whether now or in the future tackling the self or the internal changes at the level of the GCC country after this major mistake. Uh, and I would like to thank you so much, Sheikh Sahim and everyone. Thank you so much. I would like to address uh, the two questions to Dr. Khaled, although Dr. Mohanna did not address the question to Dr. Khaled. Uh, um, I think that Dr. Khaled will be capable of uh, answering uh, these uh, questions because the other papers did not uh, uh, blame the Trump administration. Uh, Dr. Khaled, you have two uh, questions. Uh, Dr. 
Khalil uh, Rashan talked about confidence building measures and uh, how do you perceive them and what could they be in the coming uh, uh, period and also Dr. Mahana is actually objecting uh, the fact that uh, Trump is to blame uh, some to, to a certain extent and there is uh, behavior from within Gulf countries and if the behavior is at the level of the Gulf countries why are we optimistic when it comes to the change in the United States when it comes to confidence building measures uh, I think it is important and I think this is the most difficult uh, period in the Gulf uh, there are problematic issues all over the Gulf uh, and we're not talking only about uh, 2017 and the Gulf crisis I think that uh, this crisis began after the Arab Spring. Every country had a different uh, uh, perception. Uh, some countries supported chain, supported revolutions. Qatar, for instance, uh, and the media coverage uh, by uh, of uh, revolution al jazeera uh, played an important role as opposed to saudi arabia and the emirates uh, who invested in the other side and wanted to keep the status quo and they did not believe that change uh, is good and uh, they were fearing that change would reach them one way or another so uh, the uh, uh, perception of uh, regional and international uh, interests changed. Uh, we talked about Iran, we talked about Israel, maybe we didn't talk about Turkey, and this needs maybe another uh, seminar or cover, but it is clear that the three regional powers are in a battle in this region, and they have their strategic uh, perception, their ideology, uh, there is a divide between Sunnis and Shias. Israel is involved. Uh, we're talking about religion, Judaism, Christian, Christian, Christianity, and uh, is, uh, Islam. But there's also the arms race, also the trade agreement. Everything is threatening the whole system and also another problematic issue when it comes to biden and his perception of the region i think the most important uh, issue with biden not only at the political level and the foreign policy level 1.7 billion uh, invested uh, by biden and this will strike the uh, gulf economy uh, what comes after the era of oil and gas, uh, especially that water resources are scarce. So I think that uh, the Biden administration will not be capable of making major changes. And if we talk today about the post-Trump era, we shouldn't be uh, very optimistic. Maybe Trump will uh, return. Uh, and uh, uh, this happened with the 22nd president who became the 24th. Uh, America is divided from within. And when it comes to foreign policy, same applies to the Gulf. We cannot talk today about a uni uh, or a unified uh, vision vis-a-vis -vis anything, uh, whether internal or external. There are also questions. Uh, will the GCC meet even uh, through Zoom like we're doing now? Uh, so there are major problematic issues, uh, confidence building, uh, the return to uh, comprehensive Gulf vision. I think this is uh, not possible in the near future. I think this will need uh, time. Until now, we don't have any indicators of such a return and i do not think that there will be a cooperation uh, by uh, the gulf as a bloc with the biden administration i think each country will uh, preserve its interests and uh, even when each country goes to the united states uh, in order to lobby uh, etc it would be at the service of their uh, uh, interests and visions and not the interest and vision of the bloc. I would like to thank you, Dr. Uh, Khaled. And um, the question is that um, beyond the pillar of uh, energy security, what other pillars would you say will be uh, the dominant pillars in the future of the GCC-Iran relationships? And thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much for the question, though it's um, going 
uh, beyond the, the the topic of of my paper, and I would say beyond the the, the topic of my special specializa specialization, and I would definitely ask uh, Dr. Macron to help me with answering it. Um, my main point uh, with my paper was uh, that basically energy security is not a pill right now, uh, of, uh, but rather I would say a factor that uh, makes these uh, relations uh, less stable in a sense that it is creating unexpectedly certain vulnerability, creating a certain space that Iran can exploit uh, within the framework of its asymmetric conflict with the um, uh, United States, with the uh, with Israel, because uh, it's also important to keep in mind that uh, for um, Iran, the tensions that emerge between it and Israel, between it and the GCC countries, they are largely considered within the framework of its uh, broader confrontation with the US. And um, the uh, key importance in terms of the uh, energy security uh, was definitely uh, played by uh, the fact that the U.S. perception of this region has changed. And it has changed due to the fact that uh, the um, dependence that existed in the previous decades on the export of hydrocarbon resources from here, uh, it changed its nature. So nowadays, uh, the United States, they, they do remain interested in the certain uh, security and stability of uh, the flow of hydrocarbons from the Gulf. But only in terms of how this flow is affecting the dynamics of oil prices, the dynamics of uh, the situation in uh, the markets. So which definitely make them less interested in um, ensuring the, the hardcore security. And definitely it le it's leading to rising the question uh, who should be actually responsible for the security of the Gulf um, in the situation when the ma major flow of hydrocarbons is going right now uh, to Asia and especially to China, one of the main opponents of the United States. Uh, if you ask my humble opinion about uh, what are the other pillars that can indeed be um, uh, the uh, solution in the existing tensions between Iran and the Gulf countries, I guess that we need to uh, adopt a broader approach and to understand that uh, the um, regional uh, security system uh, needs to be reconsidered and needs to be uh, uh, built on an absolutely different uh, pillars than uh, it is built right now. Uh, please don't understand that I'm trying to promote <laughs> the, the Russian vision of the security of the Gulf. Uh, and from my point of view, this document is extremely weak and rather represents the Russian uh, intention to get involved into the discussion than to establish something solid in the Gulf. Uh, but the direction of the thinking is definitely correct. Uh, the, the, there should be a system of uh, mutual trust and confidence built, whether it should be based on a comprehensive agreement, um, I don't know, I'm quite skeptical. Probably it should be built uh, through the um, chain of uh, minor steps, uh, through the chain of um, uh, confidence measures built, probably at the initially not in the um, hot areas, not in the sensitive areas, but in the areas where the dialogue is possible, namely again in the area of uh, cooperation in the culture, in ecology, in handling in some local conflicts, maybe to working out the modus vivendi of uh, development of joint uh, fields, uh, oil and gas fields, and first of all, the, uh, the, 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 the largest gas field here, or through the creation of uh, understanding how to ensure uh, the security of navigation again in the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, but again, uh, this is going slightly beyond the area of my analysis and expertise, and I would appreciate my colleagues to chip in to this discussion. First of all, Dr. Uh, Macron. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor. Alan, Talib, Dr. Musa and Now, uh, Dr. Musa would like to intervene. Dr. Musa, uh, the floor is yours. I would like to remind you that uh, we are about to uh, get to the end of this uh, session. You can raise uh, your hand uh, to ask a question or write down uh, your question. 
and hopefully we will have enough time to answer your question. Thank you, uh, doctor, for uh, this excellent uh, uh, moderation, uh, moderation. About the domestic politics that uh, in Iran, they are always uh, seeing the GCC countries and Arab countries via the eyes of the United States. Um, and I would like to tell them also um, that in Arab countries and also GCC countries, we are seeing to Iran uh, also via the eyes of Russia. And, and this is actually, uh, Iran has no full ownership of its foreign, uh, foreign policies or orientations. And it is kind of a uh, proxy war. And also he mentioned to a very uh, important point about uh, that Iran has no uh, way to have to establish a uh, formal relationship with GCC countries or other Arab countries. Um, uh, Iran started to establish relationship with the uh, non-state actors. And I don't know who gave Iran the, the, the right to establish a uh, diplomatic relationship with the non-state actors. Uh, it is really, this is very strange because we know the motives uh, behind that is not just uh, political things. It is more uh, religious and, uh, and the religion is element is behind that. And uh, the Iranians, they demolished societies and also states in, like in Yemen, in Syria, in Libya, everywhere. So we, we should not uh, speak with, with this, uh, uh, this regime in this way, a normal way. This is trying to demolish societies and also countries. We are suffering, especially in Yemen, we are suffering from Iran. Yemen has no nothing to do with religion before, but Iran established a lot of a lot of problems for the, for the country. What what kind of establishing a relationship with non-state actors? The Arabs have no even any links with the domestic politics in Iran. They do, they didn't establish non-state actors in Iran. Also, a lot of problems. This is is my my uh, my reaction to uh, to Mahran. Thank you so much. Shukran, uh, shukran, uh, doctor. Um, Thank you, doctor. We have another written question. It was covered uh, to a certain extent by Dr. Khalid and also uh, Dr. Mohanna when uh, Dr. Khalid uh, uh, did not uh, think that there would be a unified uh, Gulf policy. So maybe I would give the floor to Dr. Imad to answer if he's got anything to add regarding the unification of the policies and adopting uh, unified positions vis-a-vis -vis different affairs. And then we move to Dr. Mahran in order for him to answer the question. Dr. Ayman. Thank you so much for this question. In fact, we need to take into account that uh, the problem the problems are increasing between Gulf countries since uh, the beginning of the a crisis uh, and not only between Iran and Gulf countries yes there are uh, tensions between Iran and Gulf countries but uh, there are also good relations between Iran and uh, uh, Gulf countries as opposed to the situation when it comes to the intra Gulf or inter GCC uh, relations uh, uh, that are witnessing increasing tensions. So it is difficult to say that the improvement of the Gulf relations uh, is uh, uh, something uh, uh, possible uh, in order to face uh, Iran. There are uh, different positions vis a vis Iran. Uh, some countries consider Iran as an existential threat uh, like Bahrain and also main threat like uh, uh, Saudi Arabia but also Iran has good relations with uh, Oman and also good relations with Qatar so uh, counting on uh, the possibility of bending uh, this uh, security approach uh, uh, taking into account the problem between Iran and Gulf countries, this 
is actually uh, highly questionable. In the past, uh, there were uh, positions uh, by the Gulf when the GCC was established in, in 1981. There was a common objective, which is uh, defense. And uh, uh, later on, uh, it was discovered that uh, this approach was not efficient, especially vis-a-vis -vis Iran. It was used between Gulf countries, just like what happened in Bahrain. So it is difficult to say that the relations between Gulf countries, should they improve, would be uh, uh, would have a positive influence when it comes to the relation with Iran. In addition to that, just like I said in my paper, uh, the balance of power is the common approach uh, so far, and it is difficult to talk about an improvement, even if Gulf countries uh, have ad or adopt a unified policy. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ahmad. A few points in uh, in uh, the question um, uh, uh, addressed to you, mainly relating to uh, Iran and the proxies in the region and, um, and uh, your opinion about that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I fully agree with Musa that uh, the region has suffered from uh, uh, from proxy uh, wars. Uh, but I think it's important to remember also that it was Mohammed bin Salman who um, smiled and said, we're going to take the war to Iran. And that was followed by an attack on the IRGC's um, uh, military parade. Uh, and uh, just last week, uh, Iran presented evidence, intelligence evidence of Saudi involvement in that attack. And so, of course, it's uh, really important also to remember that all of these countries up and down, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, they all house uh, American bases, uh, which um, uh, fly drones to Iran and, uh, and of course, uh, uh, over Iran. And, and so I think Sitting here in, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, it's easy for us to blame Iran. Our view of the world and our security threat perceptions would have been decidedly different had we been sitting in Tehran. We would be seeing actually the fact that Saudi Arabia is financially and logistically supporting separatist movements in Iranian Khuzestan. We would be seeing that Saudi Arabia has been supporting logistically and financially separatist movements in Iranian Sistan and Baluchistan. And so I think it's important for us to step out of this mutual accusation of, well, those people are doing this, these people are doing this. And this goes to an earlier question. And what's a useful substantive step out of this orgy of accusation and counter accusation. And I think what we genuinely need is a meaningful substantive security dialogue between Iranians and the GCC. And that security dialogue needs to have certain parameters. Everybody needs to outline what their genuine security concerns are and what are their red lines? What are the contours within which they're willing to uh, uh, negotiate and, and discuss their security dialogues. Forget track to diplomacy, forget cultural exchanges, forget mutual understanding. Let's get into the substance of what is it that the Saudis, the uh, Qataris, the Kuwaitis, the Bahrainis are genuinely concerned about. And what are the red lines beyond which they're not willing to go, to go beyond? And what is the genuine concern that Tehran has? We cannot wish Tehran or Iran away. Uh, we cannot assume that Iran does not have legitimate security concerns. Just as the GCC has extremely legitimate security concerns emanating out of uh, Tehran, Tehran also has genuine security concerns. We, we cannot ignore Saudi machinations in southwestern 
uh, Iran. We, it, it happens. And, and of course, uh, uh, we, uh, Musa talked about Yemen. When elephants play, the grass suffers. When Iran and Saudi Arabia get into a tiff with one another, it's the Yemenis who suffer. When Iran and uh, United States get into it, it's the Iraqis who suffer. Every state bases its foreign policy based on strategic interests. And whether that strategic interest is carried forward by cultivating ties with militia and non-state actors, or wh whether it is sponsoring assassinations or uh, uh, giving financial assistance to separatist movements, every state does it. And for us to assume that it's only one of the states that is engaging in mischief and that state doesn't have its own security concerns is then for us to perpetuate this security dilemma that uh, has, bought us, has brought us uh, where we are. 40 years of this dialogue of the deaf that Iran has is up to no good or Iranians thinking that the GCC is American puppet has gotten us to where we are today. It's time for new thinking. And that new thinking won't occur unless and until we start addressing the mutual concerns, security concerns that each side has in relation to the other. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Khaled, Dr. Mahran, Dr. Nikolai, and Dr. Hamad, and also Dr. David, Dr. Musa, Dr. Khalil, Dr. Mohanna, for their interventions, for your valuable intervention, and for this uh, uh, valuable discussion. And we hope to see you in person next year, Corona free. Uh, just like uh, we uh, were used to. And I would like to uh, particularly thank uh, Dr. Marwan and uh, his team for organizing this forum and their appreciated efforts. Uh, uh, it is difficult to bring together people from all over the world in order to discuss these important issues and topics. And uh, we have another session about sovereign wealth funds and investment policies of the GCC states. Uh, it will start in 15 minutes. So uh, people uh, who are interested uh, in economic affairs uh, are invited. I would like to thank you all for being with us. And I would like to thank our viewers. Uh, Assalamu alaikum.